Well, tonight we uh, continue our study of the Ten Commandments, and we're rapidly making our way through uh, this quarter of study. Someone asked me, you know, Vacation Bible School, is that a commandment? It's hard to read, but no, Vacation Bible School is not a commandment, at least not listed among the ten, but we do want you to be here next week, next Wednesday night, for uh, Vacation Bible School. I can't find a thou shalt or thou must attend Vacation Bible School, so to speak, but you will be benefited from that week of uh, study, no matter your age. Uh, we want to give a lot of our attention and due to our children and the preparation, as I said in my prayer, that's already uh, taking place. Uh, it's going to be wonderful and exciting uh, for them, but it will be beneficial to all of us. And we'll say even more about that uh, on Sunday evening, kind of by way of preview. But uh, we'll be looking at the life of David. I can go ahead and tell you that before he becomes king and uh, the characteristics uh, that he exhibited and how we can, of course, um, hopefully do the same and by that improve uh, as servants of the Lord. Tonight, though, uh, commandment uh, number eight, or commandment number, yeah, it is number eight. I had to think for a moment. Uh, commandment number eight is, thou shalt not steal. And when you think of stealing, uh, you probably think of a character or something like this. You know, someone maybe sneaking around uh, in the middle of the night uh, to grab some of your stuff. Um, I don't have any survey numbers for you like I did last week uh, as it regarded the sin of adultery, but let's do an informal survey. How many of us, how many of you, not that you're guilty of stealing from another, but how many of you have been the victim of someone stealing from you? I'm surprised. I thought it'd be almost every hand. It is, um, what, 75% of us at least, minimum? Um, how many of you liked it? Yeah, uh, none of us liked it. Um, you know, I could tell you a, a couple of different occasions when I had some, um, uh, some of my things uh, borrowed without consent, so to speak. And I had to be uh, thinking about that. You know, have I borrowed something from some of you and not uh, returned it yet? I don't think that's the case. Um, one preacher, and I'm not singling anyone out. I don't think anyone maybe fits that bill tonight, but... Uh, uh, he actually, he had a stamp uh, that he put in the front of all of his books uh, and it said simply stolen from the library of. <laughs> and uh, so maybe that was a reminder when you were reading his book, if you turn to that opening page, oh yeah, I need to uh, return that. Mine just says uh, from the library of, that sounds fancy enough, Alan Judd. But anyways, um, most of us have been the victims of um, someone stealing or taking something from us that uh, did not belong to them and we did not like it. Um, it might have been something, you know, taken out of your automobile. Uh, and that feels like a violation. Uh, some of you, I guess, if we could, you know, further refine it, uh, those of you that have actually had someone come into your home or place of business uh, and steal something, uh, that's, that's troublesome. Um, my mother, on, I don't know, probably at least a half dozen occasions, uh, has, had, has been the victim of that uh, sort of crime. And uh, it's an individual in our community, it's a tight-knit community, as I've described it to you many times before. I would put a great likelihood on the fact that it's probably, if we actually could catch the individual, uh, that uh, he or she is a family member because it always happens when she's at worship or Bible study. And they know where she's at at those uh, certain periods of time. Uh, she's got up some trail cameras now, and... Um, She's not had any luck catching anybody as of yet, and I guess that's uh, a good thing. But uh, nevertheless, uh, we just don't like it when uh, people take uh, what is ours. Uh, we feel uh, violated. We feel uh, unsafe in uh, that regard. And again, uh, even if it was something that, um, you know, is of little value, um, it's still, you know, mine. And um, kind of going to her uh, situation, she had some things, of course, that my father had purchased for her that monetarily speaking, were basically worthless. I mean, take them to the pawn shop, and uh, I'd be surprised if, you know, the perpetrator got five or ten bucks, but uh, because of her emotional attachment to those items, of course, uh, uh, she felt a great sense of loss, and maybe some of you can uh, identify uh, with that sort of thing uh, as well. But uh, Scripture clearly says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 15, and again in Deuteronomy 5, 19, and there's a corresponding passage that we'll look at momentarily in the New Testament. But uh, commandment number eight says simply, you shall not steal. You shall not steal. 
Plato, the Greek uh, philosopher of uh, centuries ago, prior to even the arrival of Christ, said, He who steals a little steals with the same wish as he who steals much, but with less power. Now think about that, you know, steal a little, steal much, you know, is there a difference? Not really. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt, um, I don't know if he said this before becoming president or maybe thereafter during his term or later in life, I'm not sure the context, but he said the eighth commandment reads, thou shalt not steal. It does not read, thou shalt not steal from the rich man. It reads simply and plainly, thou shalt not steal. That's what it says. Um, now, the next quote is a little longer, and I'll have to give you the context after I read it to you, but it actually ties in with these uh, first two. Uh, this individual is a professor of law at Rutgers. He says, quote, this is not merely a question of nomenclature. The, uh, the label we apply to criminal acts matters crucially in terms of how we conceive of and stigmatize them. What we choose to call a given type of crime ultimately determines how it's formulated and classified and perhaps more important how it will be punished. Treating different forms of property deprivation, that's just a fancy way of saying stealing, treating different forms of property deprivation as different crimes may seem untidy, but that is the nature of criminal law. What do you think the context of that particular quote is? If you've been watching the news over the last decade, but um, you know, even maybe more recently, and I don't want to assign a specific maybe date, uh, but at least over the last um, you know, 10 to 20 years, uh, our society has become, I think, almost overrun by uh, the idea that authority is really something not just to be questioned but to be ignored outright if one chooses and uh, there are a lot of kind of tentacles of that sort of mindset that go off in a lot of different directions but uh, today uh, there are those who are calling for certain forms of stealing uh, to not even be labeled as prohibited behavior or criminal acts or so on and so forth and if you watch the news closely you'll uh, probably see at least once every few weeks and maybe even more often than not that in some of our larger cities a group and it's usually young people I don't know that they're all you know 18 to 25 or you know what the exact age range is but typically younger people uh, that will go into a store and just ransack it and um, you know what do we think about things like that well most of us I think feel some outrage about that uh, most of us would say, well, that wouldn't happen around here. You know, if it were my business, I would protect it. But even those business owners, they, uh, they can't, you know, take any action. And even when the police show up, if they happen to show up during the commission of the crime, uh, there are certain jurisdictions where the, um, you know, the district attorney, the prosecutors uh, won't even pursue charges. Doug. Right, and um, I guess I could give you a number of examples on that. I saw one of those, uh, it was after I already had these lessons uh, presented, but, um, and I forget, you know, what big box store it was or whatever, but, uh, you know, the store worker actually saw an individual take some piece of merchandise, you know, and exit the store without paying, and he chased him down and tackled him, and he lost his job for it, and... Uh, you know, the person that committed the crime or, you know, what we determine in our mind should be a crime, you know, was threatening legal action. And, you know, I just shake my head in amazement and say, is this, you know, the twilight zone? Is this really where uh, we live uh, in America? Uh, now, again, you know, if it's our business, we want to maybe say that won't happen. Now, um, when we were in the funeral home business, we had a uh, security system. Now you'd say, who would want to break into a funeral home? Well, you'd be surprised. Uh, they never actually broke into our facility, but um, uh, we did have on more than one occasion uh, 
We never caught this individual, and I begged Amy's daddy for just the opportunity to hide out one night to uh, just watch them, but uh, he never let me. But they would come up. We had an open-ended kind of garage on one side of the building where we'd keep some of our automobiles, including our old 1978 hers. And this individual would sneak up, and he'd siphon the gas out of it. Every week, you know, we'd fill it up, and this was back, uh, I guess, gas might have been higher than it was now, and and he'd siphon the gas out of it, and I was, you know, begging, just let me hide in the back of that thing. And, you know, once he unscrews the cap, I'd jump out, and, you know, we could bury him the next day. Uh, probably, you know, it'd scare him to death. Uh, but, or at least, you know, I'd get to see if I could catch up with him, you know, how fast he could run, if I could catch him and keep up with him. But uh, he never allowed it. Um, uh, I thought about just making a sticker, you know, and said, runs on embalming fluid or something like that. But I, I didn't do that either, you know, to kind of discourage that. But I thought, who would steal gas from a funeral home hearse? But this individual did. If I'm not mistaken, cannot use deadly force to stop that. Deadly force is unacceptable. And I'm not sure how Castle Doctrine works in Tennessee. Uh, you know, I know law enforcement people always say if you do have to take that sort of action, no matter what the perpetrator was claiming to do, say that you're in danger of your life or you felt threatened. But he's in your house, you leave. Yeah. Take matters into your own hands. And, uh, you know, that discussion we kind of had on when we went through uh, You Shall Not Murder and what that might involve as it related to uh, self-defense and so on and so forth. But it's a strange world we live in, uh, to put it mildly, and all of that is just illustrative. This last quote, of course, uh, is given from an individual who said, you know, crimes like shoplifting, they should no longer be considered criminal activity. Okay, so you mean... Uh, you know, instead of going and actually paying for things, I just go and pick out what I want and leave. Uh, what if everybody did that? You know, the old adage might be, and maybe in some places that's what apparently uh, uh, is happening. But uh, this, you know, is a strange time uh, in our nation, in our uh, culture, in our world. And where it goes from here, um, only God knows with certainty. But nevertheless, uh, God's word doesn't change, and He tells us not to steal. So, uh, what does that mean for us? Well, it means that uh, God holds personal property with some measure of sanctity. I think sometimes we paint the picture that, you know, Christianity should be about having the bare minimum and never pursuing anything other than the bare minimum. And it's clear Jesus gives a number of different parables and uh, forms of teaching that warn us about life does not consist in the abundance of the things that a person possesses. We're not to be caught up with the cares and the worries of life and uh, the riches and the things that will, uh, that will be destroyed by a moth or rust or uh, you know, be corroded uh, by time. Those things should not be our focus. Our focus must be spiritual. And yet, balancing that at the same time, God's Word says that personal property is to be, uh, you know, respected. Uh, both that which you do have, uh, there's something to say uh, maybe about our stewardship and the caretaking of the blessings God gives us, but then also, of course, uh, the responsibility we have to uh, others, uh, not to mistreat them in that regard. Uh, to take without permission, what does it mean to steal? Well, to take without permission or right, especially secretly or by force, uh, to appropriate ideas, credit, or words without right or proper acknowledgement. I'm going to revisit that one. That's an interesting idea to uh, take without permission uh, or right. And uh, I'll give you a quote on the back that uh, some of you, I think, will especially find uh, kind of um, intriguing. But uh, this commandment is equal with the rest. In other words, they're not put in a list of most important to least important. Uh, these commands, as God gave Moses, he expected his people to abide by them uh, all. Now, if we did this, uh, the bottom of your uh, workbook page there, think about how that uh, fellowship and mutual safety of the community would be enhanced. Uh, a few of you, a select few of you, you remember going to bed at night without locking your doors, don't you? You remember growing up in that sort of environment. Uh, but today, you know, everybody double checks. If there's five people in the house, everybody goes by, you know, and wiggles the door handle to make sure uh, it's locked. If you have a security system or something, you punch in the code or you do whatever's necessary to uh, arm it. Uh, but uh, 
those days are past, but God, knowing that all of his people lived in community with one another, knew uh, that they would have to you know, have that mutual respect for each other. But there are many forms of violation, and we'll talk about those in a little while. Initially, if you pick up a commentary and read, what does you shall not steal mean? Well, You'd say it means don't steal. Okay, that's simple enough. But uh, actually, um, many commentators uh, suggest that it originally referred to the way that uh, people would be stolen or kidnapped for uh, slavery purposes, uh, it seems. And uh, that was a crime. That was a transgression punishable by death, according to Deuteronomy 24, verse 7. And uh, maybe uh, in some way we see kind of a glimpse of that to... um, to echo or to mirror what Joseph's brothers did to him in Genesis 37. Now, they didn't kidnap him, uh, but they sold him on in to slavery. And uh, so they stole, as it were, almost his uh, status within the family. They stole part of his future, so to speak. Now, clearly, God's working behind the scenes providentially in all of it. You read the little phrase, for God was with him every time Joseph meets one of these obstacles and then Uh, At the end of the book of Genesis, even when his brothers are fearful uh, after their daddy died that he would retaliate, uh, he said, no, you meant it for evil. Yeah, what you did, you had no good intention uh, about it. You thought you'd get rid of me, but God sent me ahead and, you know, it was for good. Uh, So God worked it out. Uh, in that way. Uh, 1 Timothy 1 verse 8 to 11, theft is against both the law and sound doctrine. So Paul kind of combines and said this was an Old Testament precept, but it's also one God still uh, expects uh, followers of Jesus uh, to comply with. Now, uh, I think it's best just to regard it more generally uh, to include all types of stealing. And in fact, if you turn just one page over, probably from Exodus 20, you'll find chapter 21 uh, where Moses will talk about uh, if you have this sort of servant and, you know, what happens uh, with the servant and what belongs to him and what belongs uh, to the master and how all of that works. Again, uh, again, much of that is offensive to modern sensibility without our even considering the historical context of it. People just write it off. But uh, God had a form of indentured servitude and even had safeguards in place uh, for that sort of arrangement uh, that would regulate it for the benefit Uh, not just of the master, but of that servant or slave uh, under his care. And he was to be cared for by his master or she was. And uh, so that was very important. And you can read that in greater detail if you would like. Uh, Walter Walter Harrelson, uh, roll my R's there, he said, quote, The Old Testament conceives of property as a kind of extension of the self, of its owner, so that acts of theft are violations of the person. That's an interesting, but that again speaks to the sanctity that God held property with. And uh, since God is the giver of all things, and He is, uh, James chapter 1 says, every good and every perfect gift is from above. Everything we have is what God has given us. Uh, we're all the proverbial turtle on top of the fence post. We didn't get where we're at by ourselves. You know, everything we have is from God. So ultimately we could say, and I think without abusing logic whatsoever, that stealing in any form is ultimately stealing from God. If He's the giver of all. If He's given it to me and not to you and you take it from me and take it for yourself, uh, you've, you've stolen from me, but you've stolen from God in that regard. And so that's uh, an important consideration for us as well. If you flip to the back page then, uh, it's uh, true that uh, we live in a time when uh, perhaps, uh, you know, there is this sort of acceptance, whether it be of shoplifting or otherwise, but uh, many feel like that, you know, there is a sort of stealing, uh, and I'm just calling it, and I think you'll understand the reference to Robin Hood, types of stealing and uh, that is that you know if I am poor or if I am less fortunate if I have less than you if I am disenfranchised if I uh, am a member of a group that um, traditionally or at least having been told by others that uh, you know I'm not of equal status whether that's real or otherwise just pretend or make believe uh, then I can take from those Um, that have more than I. I can take uh, some of their things, if you will. But uh, noting uh, this paragraph on the top of uh, the back page, in ancient societies, goods were scarce and life was difficult. And so any theft of any measure would lead to dire consequences for uh, the aggrieved person. 
And the Tenth Commandment's actually going to, I think, provide a good and fitting summary to actually the previous at least six or seven and maybe all nine that precede it. Don't covet. Uh, don't have a desire for that other than what God has prescribed you to desire. That is namely Him and uh, worshiping Him, uh, coveting uh, desire that's inappropriate can very quickly merge into a inordinate form of worship or desire that leads one to take actions uh, against God in violation of his will. So that's kind of a summary statement. We'll notice that uh, later on in the month. But uh, here, uh, <clears throat> again, no matter how you want to classify it or what you know, sort of uh, spin you want to put on it and say, well, you know, there are those people who are you know, just... Uh, they have more than they need. They have more than they deserve. Uh, they have um, greater wealth than they could ever spend. And uh, so I think it's okay if we kind of cheat the system or if we just kind of take advantage uh, of them because that's not who I am. And, you know, we're all about equality or fairness. And we somehow think that taking action like this gets us closer to it. Uh, but in reality, of course, uh, it does not. Now, in Joshua chapter 7, if you want an example of kind of seeing all of this take place, uh, Joshua 7 is a good kind of case study. You remember by this time Moses is dead. The law uh, that he gave, uh, though is still in effect because he repeated it in Deuteronomy 5 to that second generation, but that second generation under Joshua has crossed the Jordan, and uh, Jericho is the first city uh, in their way. It's a great fortified city. Uh, God gave them a plan on how to conquer the city. You remember walking around the city one time uh, each day uh, for six days and then on the seventh day walk around it seven times. The priest will shout, the trumpets will blow, the walls will fall down flat. Sounds like a crazy military strategy but uh, when they obeyed it worked. But before uh, any of this campaign you know commences Joshua says now remember the city is doomed to destruction. Uh, it's devoted to the Lord in the, in the sense of the uh, devoted to the Lord's destruction. Abstain from, he even calls them uh, accursed things, one version uh, calls it. Uh, beware, don't take any of the uh, accursed things. If you do, you'll make uh, the nation, you'll make the camp of Israel uh, a curse. You'll trouble it. And so all of those things uh, that are accursed, they, uh, you know, they're devoted to destruction the silver, the gold, the vessels of bronze and iron, they are consecrated to the Lord. We'll use them for His purposes. That we'll put them in the treasury, probably to be used in uh, you know, the tabernacle worship and maybe in various other capacities. Uh, and so the people have their instruction. They go out and uh, for those six days they march around once each of those days. On the seventh day then they do uh, as they were told only on that day. And they shout, the walls fall down flat. Uh, the people run into the city and they utterly destroy it. Of course, Rahab, I didn't mention her, but she and her family are spared uh, because of her kindness toward the spies that had been sent in previously. And uh, the Bible says they burned the city with fire. And uh, it seems that everything has went just like it should. Except for the fact, chapter 7 opens with this statement, the children of Israel committed a trespass. Regarding the accursed thing, for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things. In essence, he's guilty of stealing, because these are things that were off limits for him. So the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. The next little village, and it seemed very insignificant, however you want to say Ai or I, Ai, uh, just the next little village. Uh, Joshua said, don't need to send the whole army up there just to... Maybe a small detachment of troops can easily overrun those folks, but uh, they go to attack, and uh, sure enough, uh, the people of Ai, they put Israel's army to flight. Thirty-six men are killed. This is always part of this episode that's so very intriguing to me. What would you have felt like if you were one of the family members of the 36 killed in that campaign against Ai? And does that seem equitable or fair, whatever other term you want to use? I, I can't get into the ethics of it tonight. It's just one of those moral quandaries that sometimes the Bible just alludes to but doesn't really give us a satisfactory answer uh, as it regards all of our curiosities. Nevertheless, Joshua, you know, he's dumbfounded, tears his clothes, falls to the earth. 
uh, stays prostrate before uh, the Ark of the Covenant, uh, begging God, God, why have you brought this people over Jordan to the, uh, at all? Uh, is this some kind, sort of cruel joke? I thought you said you were with us. I thought you said we would be victorious before our enemies. Get up, verse 10, God finally responds. Why do you lie on your face? Israel has sinned. They have also transgressed my covenant which I have commanded them. They have even taken some of the accursed thing. They have both stolen and deceived. Look at that language. That's Joshua 7 verse 11. Have both stolen and deceived and they have also put it among their own stuff. We've all got our stuff. Achan wanted more stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies but turn their backs before their enemies because they have become doomed to destruction. I won't be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed from among you. Well, the rest of the chapter, down through verse 26, uh, Joshua you know, summons the tribes, and it eventually, of course, happens that Achim, he cannot hide what he did. And, um, I mean, maybe uh, commendable he is for uh, his response when Joshua said, My son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel. Make confession to him. Tell me now what you've done. Achim said, Indeed, I've sinned against the Lord God of Israel. Verse 20, here's what I've done. I saw... Uh, among the spoils, the beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels. I coveted them. There's where commandment number 10 comes in. And took them. There's where commandment 8 is violated. They're hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. Messengers are sent. They dug it up and there it was. And uh, you'd say, well, no harm, no foul, uh, except for those 36 killed. Um, you know, he's repented, it seems. He's sad, sorry for what he do uh, has done. Uh, he did not try to hide it once his sin was discovered. Is God going to be gracious and forgiving? No. Joshua and all Israel took Achan along with his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, all that he had, brought them to the valley of Achor. Why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. It's a severe penalty for transgression of this command. Uh, like you, uh, in addition to the 36 who lost their life in the battle against Ai, uh, what guiltiness or what you know, uh, culpability did his family members have in the process? Did they aid him in or were they aiding and abetting his thievery by keeping it hidden? I don't know, some way, somehow, apparently their guilt uh, mandated that they too would suffer the penalty uh, of death. And uh, so God was very serious about that. And uh, for all time, for the rest of Old Testament history and the new, as well as even down to the present, it should serve as a reminder God takes this very seriously. Now in the New Testament, uh, the expectation, again, is not changed. Uh, this was on the front uh, side of the workbook or worksheet, but uh, again, it's listed here. Ephesians 4, Paul said, Let him who stole, steal no longer. Now, what's he talking about? Well, he's probably talking, of course, about uh, those who had become Christians. These Gentiles, and they could have been Jews among that number as well, although uh, the way Paul is writing to Christians in the city of Ephesus, it seems more likely most would contextually say he's addressing this maybe primarily to those without a Jewish background or heritage, ethnicity. Uh, let those individuals, those Gentiles who did not know God before, uh, even though they might have practiced this behavior in their past, let him who stole steal no longer. It changes. You're a Christian now. You're a follower of Jesus. That's not... Uh, the ethic by which you live. Rather, let that person labor, working with his hands what is good, that he can have something to give to him who has any need. And so uh, clearly God expects us uh, to, again, uh, abide by this precept tonight. And no matter how we classify it or characterize it or redefine it, uh, you know, any of those sorts of approaches, uh, we still are expected to uh, no longer steal if that characterized us even before whoa go back here come back there we go um let's think of maybe some less obvious examples uh or maybe uh precepts that might um might fall under this heading i'm saying might i'll, I'll welcome your feedback whether you think they do or not in matthew chapter 25 and verses 14 to 30 of course we have the familiar parable of the man that had five talents, the man that had two, and the man that had one. I don't have to give you the explanation of it. You remember it well. Uh, and, you know, what's it about? Well, it's a matter of stewardship. 
It's a matter that uh, the master had entrusted each of these servants with a talent, and that doesn't mean a skill or an aptitude. A talent was a measure of weight. And so a talent weighed, you'd weigh it in gold or silver, whatever the currency you were using, a certain weight uh, in order to give a certain value. And so the man that had five invested it and apparently did so in a wise way and gained five more. The two-talent man did likewise. And as we all recall, the one-talent man just goes and hides it. When the day of accounting arrives, he says to his master, you know, I know you're a tough guy. You're a tough customer or manager in this sense, I guess you would say. And so I was scared, you know, that was my, uh, my excuse, or that's going to be my excuse, and so I just uh, put it in the ground. That way I didn't lose anything. After all, hey, there's something to be said about uh, that and being conservative, isn't there? Except for the master said, you're a wicked servant. You're wicked, you're lazy, you're slothful. Uh, you could put a number of different adjectives uh, into his condemnation of this servant. You could have at least put it in the bank, even without FDIC uh, you could have at least had something as a meager return, perhaps uh, regardless of the interest rate. But you chose to do nothing whatsoever. And that fear uh, in choosing to do nothing is going to cost you your opportunity to be my servant. And you're now banished to the place of outer darkness. And the man that had five talent gets more. Uh, did the one talent man steal? Well, we'd say in the strictest sense, he didn't really steal, did he? I mean, he had one talent that the master gave him, and when the master returned, he gave that one talent back, so he ended up with what he started with. Did he steal? He didn't steal in the strictest sense, but he wasn't a very good steward uh, from this passage. And even though riches are dangerous, uh, the proper use of our possessions elsewhere in the New Testament might harmonize with this precept to say perhaps uh, it might be considered because of our taking advantage of opportunities uh, that those might not be given in the future. So we've had that stolen. We've allowed that to be stolen from us and even from God uh, at the same time. I'll say a little bit more about that uh, when we get down to the very bottom of the page from an Old Testament verse. Likewise, um, our diligence on the job. Now this is, I think, probably easier to put it from you know, connecting the dots uh, to say, well, what about stealing? Well, what do I do at work? Uh, I'm not talking about, um, I can't remember uh, who sung, uh, I'm, uh, talks about stealing Cadillac one part at a time. Was that Johnny Cash? That one, Johnny. Was that Johnny Cash? Okay, good. I, I had that in the back of my memory, but uh, you remember, if you remember that good old country music ballad, uh, whatever he works, uh, you know, in the factory, and so, you know, you can't just steal the car all at once, but... Uh, if you have expertise like Dan, you can just take it apart at a time, right? Take it home, put it in your shop, and put it back together. And uh, so I stole it one part at a time. Um, I don't know if that's based on a true story or not. I guess I kind of doubt it. But uh, anyways, I did hear about a man one time that, uh, uh, you know, the boss or the foreman, whatever the manager suspected, uh, you know, that this guy was guilty of stealing. And so every day he would, uh, you know, exit the gates when the bell sounded or whatever, and he was pushing his wheelbarrow, and he had it filled up with sand or gravel or whatever. I don't know what kind of place he worked at. And, you know, they'd dig through all of that, and they couldn't find anything. And uh, that went on for, you know, a number of years, and the guy finally decides to retire. And they said, we know you've been stealing from us this whole time, but we can never figure out what it was. We'd check uh, every day when you left. What were you stealing? He said, wheelbarrows, you know, so... Uh, <laughs> Just roll it on out. And so uh, that's what he was stealing. Well, uh, what do I do at work? Colossians 3, verse 22, bond servants. You say, well, I'm not a servant. I feel like a slave at work. Uh, is that still applicable? Just insert, if you prefer, employee. Employees, obey in all things your master, boss, manager, whatever you call him or her, according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. I'm guessing everyone that's worked any amount of time, you've worked with that person that only works when the boss is watching, right? Right? Everybody, yeah, I heard an amen back there. <laughs> you know, you've got that one person that that's all they do. Now, again, depending on the job that you have, that may not be as easy as otherwise. Uh, I worked um, when I was out of high school. There was a full-service car wash right on Jefferson across from 
uh, the stock barn in Cookville. We'd get to chase cows down in Jefferson every once in a while because I was a country boy. That was my job, one of my jobs. I, I enjoyed that part of it. But we had one just good old boy. Uh, he, his driveway didn't make it quite all the way to the front porch, if you know what I'm saying. And um, that was because of a lot of his uh, poor choices. But nevertheless, uh, you know, he'd goof off most of the day uh, but, you know, if uh, the guy that owned the car wash uh, stepped out, he'd be working hard. And uh, on more than one occasion, you know, I'd just be catching my breath, been drying a car off. You know, it's 110 uh, out there in July or whatever. And uh, on more than one occasion, the guy that owned, he'd say, why can't you work hard like Bruce? And I'm look around, you know, just turn around and watch how hard Bruce works, you know. Uh, but we've had that kind of guy. Here's uh, Paul's words. He said, don't be that kind of guy. You're not just working when the boss is watching. He may sign your paycheck, but in reality, God signs your paycheck. I think uh, now Paul might not have understood that interpretation uh, if I were to give it to him when he wrote these words in verse 23 in the first century. But I think tonight that's what we'd say. Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, not to men, knowing that from the Lord you receive the reward. God signs your paycheck. No matter whose name is on the line at the end of the week, it's actually God who gives you this opportunity and these blessings. So work knowing that you serve Him and do it in that way uh, with diligence. Um, Christians ought to be the best employees you know, of anyone at any job. That's what we should be. Uh, we should be the best employees. We may not be the most talented. Uh, we may not... Uh, you know, have uh, some of the skills uh, that maybe some of our co-workers do. Uh, we may, you know, have less than desirable even working conditions, and uh, yet we should still, I think, because of diligence and wanting to be examples uh, of Jesus, uh, be the best workers, be the best employees. Titus chapter 2, uh, in that long section where Titus gives instruction on older women to teach younger women, older men to teach uh, younger men, it's really just, you know, we need to learn from each other. We, we grow by uh, sharing life experiences and sharing that wisdom. Uh, exhort, verse 9, bond servants. Again, we would say employees today to be obedient to their own masters, to be well-pleasing in all things, not answering back, not pilfering, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Uh, here's where Paul, maybe by inspiration, uh, writes uh, something that's more applicable today than maybe it was even then, if that's possible. Uh, the word there for pilfering, uh, it's the same word that we would use today to describe embezzling. And again, most of us that have worked at different places um, through the years, uh, you've probably uh, observed um, you know, that happening. And if you didn't observe it firsthand, uh, you know, you got a notice uh, or a company-wide meeting or the HR people said, you know, so-and-so, and they've been terminated. They were skimming off the top. They were embezzling, and, you know, that kind of thing happens. Uh, that kind of thing happens. Um, sadly, there are a number of uh, church examples that we could use of that uh, sort of activity happening of all places. Uh, I remember um, one old guy, he told me, he said, um, you know, we used to go up and make change in the collection plate. We'd put in a 20 and get out a 10 and three fives. And um, well, it's a pretty good rate of exchange, isn't it? Put in a 20 and get out of 10 and three fives to make change. Yeah, uh, if you're wanting to steal from the Lord, go ahead and, uh, you know, do that. I'm not going to have that on my conscience. So uh, don't be pilfering. Don't be uh, embezzling. You work for the Lord, no matter, you know, what company name or what CEO signs your paycheck. Uh, here's some other forms of stealing. In Deuteronomy 25, uh, God said to his people, don't have a heavy weight and a light weight. Uh, they didn't have a bureau of standards and measurements, so uh, they would measure probably agricultural commodities, and there would be some agreed upon weight. And uh, you can, you know, easily understand that if you're selling, you know, you might use uh, a heavy weight uh, to make it appear that you're giving more than you actually are. If you're buying, you want to use the lighter weight to get more than you actually do. Uh, misrepresentation. Uh, this is one that really kind of gets me. And if you'll uh, flip back there, I'll read it for you. But in Proverbs 20 and verse 14. The Bible says, it's good for nothing, cries the buyer. But when he's gone his way, then he boasts. I'm not a wheeler and dealer. I buy high and I sell low. Now, if you know anything about wheeling and dealing, you know that it's supposed to be the opposite. You're supposed to buy low and sell high. Uh, I just, I, I can't do that. I know of an individual tonight, and I won't tell you where, give you any identifying information other than to say uh, he is 
a Christian, and um, I, I remember trying to get his advice, and he said, well, you know, you've always just got to make it look better than it is, make it sound better uh, than it is. And I said, well, what if they ask, oh, you, you don't have to, you know, answer that, and talking about, you know, this wheeling and dealing sort of thing. And I, I don't know, I, I've never felt comfortable uh, in doing that. And so uh, if I take a loss, I take a loss on a car or whatever other item I'm trying to sell. Uh, here, that's what Solomon's warning about. The buyer says it's good for nothing. Even I, I don't want to take advantage of the person, you know, selling me uh, something. Uh, I had a grandpa, my father's father, um, he was an extraordinary at that. I mentioned the, the stock barn. He'd go and just see what kind of deal he could make. And uh, the story goes, you know, he took this same old cow up to the stock barn. The first week, somebody asked him, what do you want for your cow? He said, $25. They said, that's too high. He took it back the next week, and they said, what do you want for your cow? And he said, $50. They said, that's too high. He took it back two more weeks. The fourth week, he said, I want $100, and they bought it. And they could have bought it, you know, for $25 uh, to start with. I just wouldn't feel comfortable in doing that, but, you know, uh, some people do. Laziness is a form of stealing. If you don't work, you don't what? Eat. God's Word says, you know, our society says otherwise, inadequate pay. James chapter 5 uh, talks about those who are employers, those who have servants under them. Uh, you might be in that capacity if you own your own business. Are you adequately compensating your employees? And um, that's something that you know, needs to be seriously considered. I know you have a bottom line to make. I know you have a profit and loss statement. I know all of those things to be true, but... Uh, would God look at what you're doing and say that you're defrauding those that work hard for you? Uh, that's something you must consider. Uh, you can probably think of others. Uh, I'm not sure how many more we might, but for time's sake, um, uh, we've already talked about this. Some types of stealing are socially acceptable. Isaiah said long ago, some people call you know, light darkness, darkness light, sweet, bitter, bitter sweet. But uh, you know, people want to steal intellectual property. Um, Sometimes preachers, when we have meetings, people get caught up on this. It usually happens at least every other year at PTP. They say, you know, should you give credit to every single person that you get an idea from in a sermon? I don't think I could do that. If I did, that's all I would do. And instead of the 40 minutes that I'm usually talking, it'd be four hours with just citation after citation. And I don't know who the old preacher was, but I liked what he said, and I wrote it down in the front of my study Bible. He said, I milk a lot of cows, but I churn my own butter. That's what I try to do too. I milk a lot of cows, but I churn my own butter. But uh, sometimes stealing from others, uh, there I said I'd mention the very last point. If you steal from one author, it's plagiarism. You'll get that when you go to school. If you steal from many, it's research. I love that statement. If you steal from one, it's plagiarism. If you steal from many, it's research. Um, well, there we go. Hey, come back. Malachi 3, verse 8, will a man rob God? Evidently somewhere in, his, in that day, Malachi's day, You've robbed me. How might one rob God? Well, in the way that we give uh, might be the easiest, most obvious answer because Malachi goes on to say in tithes and offerings they weren't keeping up their part of what the law demanded. They were holding back, not trusting God maybe to meet their needs. Uh, I wrote down some others. If I waste my time, am I stealing? Ephesians chapter 4 says, I need to redeem the time. The days are evil. I've got three score and ten, Psalm 90 says. I might have four score. In other words, 70 or 80 years, that's what most of us can expect. Some of you have already exceeded both the 70 and the 80. You're living on borrowed time tonight. I know you know that. I've not got yet to that three score and ten, not even to the three score. I'm going that direction, but I may not even reach... Uh, I'm a little past two score. That might be all that I get, so I don't need to waste time. Every day is precious, and every day should be lived for the Lord. It doesn't mean I never rest. It doesn't mean uh, I never do anything, you know, that's uh, helpful to my recreation and well-being, but it means I use my time wisely, and that even goes with my energy and efforts and otherwise. Any questions tonight? Everyone's waiting anxiously to run back in here. Anything else on you shall not steal? As always, I hope this has been helpful and practical to you. We'll take next week off for Vacation Bible School, but that doesn't mean that you get a pass to not be here. Be here for Vacation Bible School. But we'll pick up our Ten Commandments study following that good week. Thank you for being here tonight.